It just needs to be tough and be a work tool. That's complete bullshit. This thing sucks. Now some of their engines are good and some of their engines not so good. I like the fact that it feels like a, a tough work truck. That's what this is supposed to be. Of all of the used 4x4 dual cab utes on the market, apparently the Holden Colorado offers the best value for money. But does it? Because what goes wrong with these? How are they aging? What do they like to live with and drive? And should you buy one at all? But before we enter all of that and so much more, here's the critical stuff you need to know. First of all, in this video, we're just going to be focusing on the 2012 to 2020 RG generation. The previous RC, it deserves its very own video. While these share a whole bunch of components with the Isuzu D-Max, the engine, transmission, and a few other bits and pieces are different. Not to mention, Holden calibrated these for Australian conditions. Although not all Colorados are the same, Holden tweaked and revised the Colorado multiple times during its life cycle. While the Colorado did feature a couple of different engines, the vast majority on the used market featured this 2.8 litre turbo diesel. It's these we're going to be focusing on. Speaking of the overwhelming majority, while the Colorado has been available in a two-door and a crew cab version, the four-door dual cab is by far the most popular, as has been the part-time 4x4 drivetrain. However, 4x2s are out there, as are nearly a dozen different trim specs and variants, not to mention the Holden Special Vehicles Enhanced Sports Cat and the occasional LS V8 converted examples stalking neighbourhoods. Then on top of all this, many Colorados can feature a host of different option packs, not to mention plenty on the used market are drenched in aftermarket accessories. But overall, it's pretty much safe to say that no matter what form you want your ute to be in, there will be a Colorado that will fit the bill. Now as far as pricing goes, under $20,000 will get you into a pretty tired old 4x2 DX. The other end of the spectrum, a bit under $60,000 will get you into a pretty mint condition and recent Z71. And that does seem to represent really good value because a similar age and kilometre Ranger, Amarok or Hilux are going to be asking thousands more. However, with Holden no longer existing anymore, that does raise a lot of questions about long-term value, which could certainly take a hit. Also speaking of things that you don't want to take a hit, your wallet. If you're looking for car finance, or even if you currently have car finance, hit the driver link down there. All the details are in that link down there, but driver exists to get you the very best possible finance deal. You could end up saving thousands. Plus, if you secure your finance via that link, we're going to give you 150 bucks worth of free fuel. Now, a quick tip, if you are in the market for one of these, the first thing you need to do is to find out if the thing has been off-road or not. Make sure you get underneath and look for any signs of abuse. Also, if it's fitted with hardcore mud tires or maybe a winch, it's safe to assume that it's been off-road a lot. We expand on this and so much more in our ultimate 4x4 buyer's guide. The link is down there. Also, if the Colorado you're looking at has accessories fitted, just make sure all of this stuff works because sometimes it doesn't. However, something that does work, for me at least, are the looks, especially on the post facelift models. Now, some of you will claim that the looks of your 4x4 dual cab ute don't matter because it's just a ute, mate. It just needs to be tough and be a work tool. That's complete bullshit. There's a reason that these companies spend millions on the design and looks of them. It's because you like good looking cars. And for me, it looks good. But aside from the good looks, especially when it's wearing the right set of boots, just like this example, when it comes to exterior features, they are gonna vary depending on the trim spec and the year. Generally speaking, if you want parking sensors, a rear view camera, or any modern levels of exterior features, you're gonna need to be looking at LTs and LTZs at the very least. Actually, you know what? With so many variants of these things, the easiest way to make sense of the Colorado range is to jump on redriven.com and check out the completely free Colorado cheat sheet. It will answer all of your questions. The same goes for inside, it would take us all day if we were to explain all of the potential features in here. But inside, there are some highlights, but there are also some lowlights. From 2016, all Colorados come fitted with MyLink infotainment systems that allows Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And if you want the larger 8-inch screen over the smaller 7-inch screen, you're going to have to go for an LTZ or a Z71. However, while we're talking about MyLink, according to many owners, this thing sucks. We will delve more deeply into what goes wrong with this when we get to the what goes wrong section in this video. Also, pre-MyLink, the infotainment is a far simpler unit. It lacks a lot of features, but at least it works. Now, some fun facts. The Colorado, when brand new, was the only ute in its class that could be started remotely from the key fob, and that means you can turn the air conditioning on to cool the cabin down so you don't roast yourself in the middle of summer. Also, some of the switch gear, like the indicator and wiper stalks, and the steering calibration on later models, is shared with the VF Commodore, and that means they're both excellent. However, according to many owners, these seats 
they aren't. There are loads of complaints in the owners groups about how uncomfortable these seats are. For me, yeah, they are on the firm side. They are more like a bench than a supportive seat at all. We did find it really comes down to your size and weight. Some owners do find them really comfortable. Personally, they're not the most uncomfortable seat, but yeah, not very cushy. I should mention most Colorados on the used market will feature all the standard stuff you'd expect. Air conditioning, central locking, power windows, power mirrors, all that kind of thing. Although some of the earlier and lower spec models, they miss out on Bluetooth. Easily fixed, just replace the infotainment system with an aftermarket system. In fact, doing that will probably stop a lot of the complaints surrounding this as well. Also, a few people have complained about the overall fit and finish and design of the interior. It does improve with each successive year and update. Personally, I think it suits what this is about. This is a work ute. It should feel resilient and utilitarian to a point. If you're after more luxury, maybe check out an Amarok or maybe even a Ranger, but it's fine. It's no standout, but it's like this is the interior of a ute. And because of that, obviously there are hard, scratchy plastics everywhere. It is a sea of grey, but wear and tear is quite good. There's a few little scratches and whatnot here and there, but they're easily fixed up. Obviously, each ute is going to have different wear and tear. This one is used on a daily basis. It does go off-roading on most weekends. It's fine. I mean, some of the texture's lost off the steering wheel here, but the seat fabrics are all fine. It's just, it's tough. And as is the practicality. Glove box is pretty massive for all of your junk. There's a spot sort of okay for your phone just there, or a Nokia 3210 just there. Spot for your e-tag or e-toll tag just up the top. Pretty decent sized door bins there. Two cup holders. Now, some people have complained that these cup holders are absolutely crap for holding cups. I don't know, I haven't had a problem with this one. You'd probably fit a small pretentious coffee in there. That's the most important thing. A uh, bit of a cubby hole here, not too bad. It's just not too bad. Not too bad seems to be the overall vibe with this interior. One thing I do really like about the interior is just how chunky everything is. Like big solid buttons and everything's easy to use and just feels like a truck. That's what you want in something like this. Okay, in the back seat, I'm exactly 18 centimeters taller than Colorado-born Justin Timberlake aficionado and actor Jessica Biel. This is in my driving position. Okay, space-wise quite good. Loads of knee room, heaps of foot room, and it feels quite airy and spacious. Negatives? The seats are so firm, like there's almost no cushioning. It feels like I'm sitting on a wooden bench. Plus my knees are way higher than my hips, so that's gonna get uncomfortable over a long period of time. It's nice that you recline back a little bit. In some dual cab utes, you sort of feel like you're sitting up way too upright. Interesting, I don't know if I'd, I'm, like I'm struggling to get comfy. I don't know how long I'd wanna be sitting back here. As far as wear and tear goes, this back seat does get a solid workout and pretty good for wear and tear. The occasional scratches here and there, seats are still in good nick. As I said, all Colorados are gonna vary depending on what use they get, but this one, pretty good for wear and tear. And then as far as practicality in the back seat, not great I'm afraid, no matte pockets. There's only one power outlet here. It has got door pockets, but they're, they're a bit hard to get to. There's a pull-down armrest, but there's no cup holders in it. Even under the seats and behind the seats, not a lot of storage. I can't seem to find any cup holders anywhere. They're not real obvious. Owners, where are the cup holders back here? Let me know. Now, in the tray, obviously, it's practical back here. But how practical? Well, it's pretty much average for this class of ute. Not the biggest, not the smallest. The same can be said for towing as well, although with 500 newton meters of torque on tap, many owners claim that these things pull like a freight train versus a lot of the competition. Also with these, fun fact, these will hold exactly 650 strands of dry spaghetti. Very handy. Question for you, what is it about these full drive dual cab utes that make so many owners drive like complete assholes. I mean, this does feel big and tough and truck-like, but it's not making me want to tailgate every car in front of me or drive like a complete dickhead. What am, what am I missing here? Anyway, look, for the majority of people out there, a Colorado will cover their off-roading needs in standard form just fine. Although, for the minority of you that do want to take one of these things seriously off-road, they don't have a rear diff locker as standard. You're gonna to need to fit one of those with an aftermarket unit. And trust me, it makes a hell of a difference when the going gets very tough. Another potential negative, a lot of owners have complained that the, the throttle response is quite sloppy. It's hard to judge what your right foot is doing versus how the engine responds. In this one, it's interesting. From low revs, like from just takeoff, yeah, it's a little bit not hesitant, but just a bit vague. Once you're up to speed, but responds fine. Maybe that's just the update. Let us know, have you had problems with that? 
Also, on some of the earlier auto models, they used to get this horrible shutter through the auto transmission, mainly on acceleration. This being a post-update model, that's a 2019, Holden sorted all of that out. Holden also answered a bunch of complaints about just noisy cabins and a feeling of harshness in here. Again, being post-update, did they fix that? It is better, a bit. Although one issue I found, the brakes, they still feel, this is right across Colorado's, the brakes just feel really spongy and it doesn't inspire confidence at all. Also, it's important to know, unlike the Triton and the Amarok, these things on a sealed surface are rear wheel drive only. Also, owners have complained about issues with traction control, either the calibration's all wrong or it doesn't work or it overly works or it just steps in at the wrong time. Be aware of that. Around town and in the suburbs, it doesn't feel anywhere near as refined or even SUV-like as an Amarok or a Ranger. Personally, I don't mind that. I like the fact that it feels like a, a tough work truck. That's what this is supposed to be. The Colorado was calibrated for Australian conditions, and yeah, to a degree, you can tell. It's nowhere near as refined as some of the competition, but it's better than you'd expect. But what about safety features? What can you expect with those? Well, to explain, how about we just show a graphic while I provide some musical backing Starting with the world's loudest indicator tick. Before we get into what goes wrong, I've just got to say, Colorado owners groups, you guys are amazing. Thank you so, so much for all of your help and assistance putting this video together. We couldn't have done it without you. You might be one of the best owners groups we've ever dealt with. But now to betray all of those wonderful owners, what goes wrong with these things? Let's start with the exterior. Some owners are reporting that they're finding chassis cracking above the wheel arches inside the engine bay. Although, in saying that, some of the Colorado experts we spoke to, they questioned if the Colorados that are having these issues may be fitted with dodgy aftermarket suspension lifts and have been driven deep and hard off-road with no mechanical sympathy. Next up, there are reports that the high-mounted rear brake light, it can leak. Also, the antenna can leak. The problem with this is the water can drain down the A-pillar, down the back of the firewall and pull on the foot wells. Also, apparently for some owners, the roof rack rails, they can also leak, but apparently that's not a hard fix. Speaking of water issues, OEM wiper blades are often far too expensive and aftermarket ones can be utter crap. Luckily, Wiper Tech can fix that. Guys, great wipers are critical, especially if you're driving through mud or crap. And if you want 15% off and free express shipping on some of the best wiper blades we've ever used, hit that link down there. Next up, as one owner put it, these headlights can be more dim than your average Commodore owner. His words, not mine. Also, the actual headlight bulb retainer clips, they can, they can be pretty weak as well. Apparently, the reversing camera can fail to show the grid lines on occasion. That's just annoying. Then there are reports that when you open the door and the window goes down like that, that can fail. And then there are the reports that on older Colorados, some of the exterior plastics can just start to fade. Even the graphics, they can fade and start to peel off. Now inside, the big complaints all surround this MyLink infotainment system. Honestly, if you want an entertaining read, get on the owners groups in the forums and have a read at just how shit these can be. It's hilarious. I'm talking everything from Bluetooth dropping out, ghost touching, so you won't really even touch it, but it just changes the music or hangs up on whoever you're talking to. If you can think of a complaint about this, it does it. Now to fix this, some owners recommend just doing a software update. That does apparently fix it, but then some owners have had the complaints come back even when it has been fixed. The easiest way to fix this is just to ditch this completely and fit it in quality aftermarket system. Although in saying that, Adrian that owns this particular Colorado, he's had no issues with this modeling system. In fact, he's had no issues with this Colorado at all. And that is the case for so many owners. It seems like some owners have had all of the problems and owners like Adrian have had no problems. Actually, just on Adrian, mate, thank you so much for lending us your Colorado. You're a bloody legend. Also, if you own a cool car that you'd like to see us feature on Redriven, let us know in the comments down there or hit us up on the socials. Aside from that, inside there are the odd sporadic reports of the occasional electronic gremlin here and there, and apparently on some of the earlier models, some of the plastics can get a bit brittle, but not what we would call common problems at all. But mechanically, what's the story with these? Well, I would love to tell you, but I can't because I'm not a qualified mechanic. But Jim is. The engine in these is actually not made by Holden. It's designed and made by VM Motori. Now some of their engines are good and some of their engines not so good. Overall, the 2.8 Duramax in the Colorado is actually pretty good. 
Now, some of them do have some oil consumption issues. Now, that is primarily around the 14 and 15 year models, but it's actually not unheard of in other models too. So definitely something to keep an eye out on. They do have all of the same type of DPF and EGR complications as everything else in its class, but it should be said they don't have as many DPF issues as Hiluxes, and they certainly don't have as many EGR issues as Rangers. And just on the DPFs in these, uh, they do have a mounting bracket that actually breaks off fairly frequently. Uh, a lot of those were modified and renewed under warranty. A common issue, but really not that expensive. They do have a habit of bursting intercooler pipes, so keep an ear on that. Something to look out for, up into the left-hand wheel well, there's a section of wiring that go, goes up over the chaise rail. That actually has a habit of rubbing through and causing all sorts of you know, ECU and body control and ABS control module issues, um, and it's just based on this wire rubbing through. It's a fairly common issue. If it's not damaged, you can just isolate it and put some insulation on it and you'll never have a problem. But if you're having a whole bunch of weird electrical issues, look there first. These engines have a timing belt, not a timing chain, and they're due for renewal every 150,000 Ks or every 90 months. Uh, and while you're in there, if you're doing that, just change the drive belt tensioner as well. About the same time should be good because they, that is a known issue too. Now, another common problem on these is the airbox or the air filter housing. They are piss weak uh, and the screws that hold it together just strip out. Now, sometimes that can happen when just servicing, especially if you over tighten and they strip. Now, if that's not sealing properly, that will allow dust into it, which is a known problem on these. Dust in an engine is bad. Um, there are plenty of aftermarket options to upgrade and sort that problem out. Now, the battery terminals on these, if you have one, you probably know what I'm talking about. They have this weird over center clamp for a battery terminal. They are a terrible idea and they're pretty much disposable. Uh, if you're having any electrical issues or if you're changing a battery or just do it anyway, those clamps you have to change and upgrade to more conventional battery terminal clamps. They're terrible. We have seen in these uh, the front diff housings can fail. That might be owner operator technique, uh, but it definitely is something that's happened a few times. So if you're, if you're doing serious off-road stuff, just keep an eye out for that. Probably the biggest issue with these is actually the transmission. There's a lot of torque converter and valve body complications and you'll know you've got an issue. They just have this terrible shuddering off the line. In some cases, quite often under warranty, they attempt this fluid flush called a triple flush. In some cases that does alleviate the symptoms for a while, but it doesn't address the root cause of the issue. In some cases, people have just got a new torque converter, which has helped in the short term. Um, but later on, there's issues again. And what, it, what happens in these is the valve body, which is part of the oil pump, that just fails internally and that creates a torque converter issue. You really need that repaired and the torque converter just to get it done properly. Now, if that's done under warranty, that's great. But remember that warranty won't be around forever. And later, that is gonna be a very expensive fix. And again, with the transmissions, some people experience overheating when towing. Look, like anything, it's a great idea if you're towing to upgrade the oil cooler and service a transmission every 50,000 Ks, not 150, which is the recommendation. Do it every 50, put a big oil cooler on it and you'll have less problems for sure. Now, a lot of people come to me with Colorados and they wonder, well, what's the future like for spare parts with these now that Holden doesn't exist? Now that's a bit like asking how long's a piece of string. The good thing is Holden sold a lot of these and this engine and transmission are in a lot of other models so you should be able to get parts for them for a while anyway. And the fact that Holden did sell a lot, there's probably always going to be a reasonable amount of secondhand parts around too. Okay, you want to know a bit of a, an automotive secret? All dual cab utes, all of them, are pretty bloody good. And they're all a bit shit. Hilux, Ranger, Navara, D-Max, T60, Triton, BT50, Amarok, they all have their pros and cons. Some are standouts in some departments, but impress less in others. The Colorado is exactly the same. These are far from perfect, and yes, a lot can potentially go wrong, but they also offer incredible value for money, and they make for a pretty appealing option if you just want a no-nonsense work you. Some owners have loved theirs, others maybe haven't, but if it checks out with a thorough pre-purchase inspection and suits your needs, should you buy one? Yeah, why not? Or should you buy one of these instead? But if you weren't to buy this or that, why would you buy any of the other ones? Let us know in the comments below. Air conditioning, power windows. My God, why can't I remember words? These engines are a timing chain. No, oh, they're not. <laughs> not to mention Holden, cal <coughs> sorry. <coughs>